to the Great Variety of Readers, Part 1. There you are numbered. The frontispiece of the first folio has engraving the author of the plays, perhaps. We're going to go back into the front matter of the first folio. And we're going to look at the companion piece to the Epistle Dedicatory. This is the letter to the great variety of readers. Here I will read it. To the great variety of readers, from the most able to him that can but spell, there you are numbered. We had rather you were weighed, especially when the fate of all books depends upon your capacities, and not of your heads alone, but of your purses. Well, it is now public, and you will stand for your privileges, we know, to read and censure. Do so, but buy it first. That doth best commend a book, the stationer says. Then how odd soever your brains be, or your wisdoms, make your license the same, and spare not. Judge your sixpen worth, your shillings worth, or your five shillings worth at a time, or higher. So you rise to the just race, and welcome. But whatever you do, buy. Censure will not drive a trade or make the jack go. And though you be a magistrate of wit, and sit on the stage at Blackfriars or the cockpit to arraign plays daily, no, these plays have had their trial already and stood out all appeals, and do now come forth quitted rather by a decree of court than any purchased letters of commendation. It had been a thing, we confess, worthy to have been wished that the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writings, but since it had been ordained otherwise, and he by death departed from this right, we pray you not to envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them, and so to have published them. As where, before, you were abused with diverse stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them, even those are now offered to your view cured and perfect of their limbs, and all the rest absolute in their numbers as he conceived them, who, as he was a happy imitator of nature, was a most gentle expressor of it. His mind and hand went together, and what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. But it is not our province who only gather his works and give them you to praise them. It is yours that read them. And there we hope to your diverse capacities you will find enough both to draw and hold you, for his wit can no more be hid than it could be lost. Read him, therefore, and again and again. And if then you do not like him, surely you are in some manifest danger not to understand him. And so we leave you to other of his friends, whom, if you need, be your guides. If you need them not, you can lead yourselves and others, and such readers we wish him. The 18th century Shakespearean scholar George Stevens was the first to insist that Ben Jonson was the true author of this letter. He did so based on the following evidence. Many of the passages in this letter have been paraphrased in Jonson's works, including Timbers, which is published in 1641. If Hemings on Condell had access to Ben Jonson's commonplace book, and we doubt they did, then they could possibly have remembered some of these passages to use in this letter. However, Stevens wasn't the only person to believe that this was written by Johnson. Several of the most prominent 19th century scholars of Shakespeare also agreed with him. 
W. G. Clark, W. Aldous Wright, and John Glover in the yellow boxes, they were the editors of the Cambridge Shakespeare. They were no slouches, so we must take their conclusions for the weighty and learned statements they are. As usual for most of these puzzles, we have to find instructions to count. In this letter, there are two very obvious instructions to count. The very first line says, From the most able to him that can but spell. There you are numbered. Also, the odd spacing in the punctuation and the words in the line give us some more hints that there's something up. The comma between able and to is crammed right between them with no spaces. And yet, the space between the L in spell and the uppercase T is wider than is necessary. We also have a clue in paragraph 2 in which it says, they are perfect of their limbs and absolute in their numbers. This is a direct reference to John Dee's mathematical preface to the Elements of Euclid, published in 1570, in which he says, may we be led upward by degrees, so informing our rude imagination towards the conceiving of numbers absolutely that at length we may be able to find the number of our own name gloriously exemplified and registered in the book of the Trinity, most blessed and eternal. It is also a reference to Pliny's epigram 9, 938, in which he says, Lego enum librum omnibus absolutum. We'll start with some paragraph one counts. First of all, there are 17 lines in paragraph one. In the lower part of the screen, I'm going to show a 17 tally to count how many times and keep track of the many times we can get the number 17 easily and quickly. The gematria value of the uppercase R in from has a value of 17 followed by 40 characters. This is another 1740 illusion. If we count the number of letters adjacent to the uppercase F, we find that there are 17 lowercase characters. That gives us a 17 tally of three. Next, we see that there are four uppercase T's on the right-hand side of the paragraph. So, we see 17 begins the gematria values of the uppercase R. It's followed by 40 characters. And 4T is a homophone of the number 40. There are 17 lines in the paragraph, giving us two examples of the 1740 illusion. Paragraph 2 counts. As with everything in the Shakespeare authorship game, we have to look at the bigger picture first before we go into the smaller picture. There are 22 lines in paragraph 2, 17 lines in paragraph 1, and one line in the title. That gives us a total of 40 lines. Notice that the sign off is at the same level and below the collation mark for the at the bottom of the page. Therefore, we do not count that in our total. Let's continue on with paragraph two. These are all the uppercase letters in the paragraph. There are 17 uppercase letters. Interpreting paragraph two. 
I'm going to do a short interpretation of this paragraph just to keep us on the right track that there are puzzles and clues in the game here. First, Johnson tells us that we, the readers, were abused with diverse stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors. He's telling us that they were unauthorized pirated copies. He also tells us that they are now offered to your view cured and perfect of their limbs, which is a bit more deception because they are not perfect because there are mistakes within the folio. And then he says, all the rest. Absolute in their numbers, which means they are perfect in their verses. But what does he mean by all the rest? Did the playwright compose the front matter? Johnson says, as he conceived them. Who is he? Perhaps he did compose the front matter. Note the next line. There is no change in pronoun, who, as he, was a happy imitator of nature. He was also a most gentle expressor of it, and in this context the word gentle means high-born. The phrase, his mind and hand went together, is evidence of a perfect memory. He's telling us that what he thought, he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. In other words, he wrote so well and could memorize so many passages that they did not have to do many corrections. That's what blot in his papers means, corrections. Now we continue with the sign-off. Like we did with the Epistle Dedicatory, we're going to section off these letters by drawing lines between them, like so. Notice how that some of the letters don't have letters above or below them. We begin with the uppercase I in John. Next, we have the R in Henry and the L in Condell. When we put them together and pronounce the word, we get Earl, but for one letter in this word, it would spell Earl in Welsh. All we need to do is add a lowercase i between the uppercase i and the lowercase r. Notice that the letter r has no letters directly above it or below it. Contrary to all the other letters other than the uppercase i in John and the l in Condell, the second l. That has a gematria value of 17 giving us a tally of five. The final L in Condell has a gematria value of 11. And the uppercase I has a value of nine. If we add these up, we get 20. Notice that this has exactly the same type of puzzle. as what we have seen in the dedication to the reader. To the reader corresponds to the number 11 because there are 11 letters. When we expand Ben Johnson's names, or initials rather, to his name, we get nine. Nine plus 11 is 20. Two things on the outside of a text add it up to get 20. And of course, 20 is equal to the letter V in Gematria.
Summary of evidence. We have a 17 tally of five, beginning with 17 lines in the first paragraph. And of course, there are 40 lines in the letter from the title right down to the signature mark. We have about 1740 illusion in the very first line. We have a second 1740 illusion in that there are 17 lines in this paragraph and there are four uppercase T's to give us a homophone for 40. Paragraph two has 17 uppercase letters. And IRL is a shortened form of the title Earl. Earl is Welsh for Earl. The up lower case R in Henry, which is isolated, has a gematria value of 17. We also have the two outermost isolated letters, the uppercase I in John and the second L in Condell, added some of 9 plus 11, which is 20, and 20 has a gematria letter value of the letter V. Notice again the pattern, 17 lines in paragraph 1, 40 characters in line 1. and four T's for 40. 17 uppercase letters in paragraph two, which ends at the 40th line. And we also have the word gentle, meaning highborn. This constitutes more evidence that Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, was Shakespeare. Don't miss howsoever odd your brains be. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.